decoding the regulatory genome, picking up where Professor Kellis left off on Tuesday. And I'll say that if you could take this slide deck back about 25 years, you would be the master of the NIH Encode project. Because today we're going to reveal all the secrets of this $400 million Encode project to you in a scant 90 minutes. So stay tuned. We're going to begin just uh, reminding you of Okay, of the way genomic regulation is implemented. And in the past, we've taught this course, some folks who are more computationally inclined say that, you know, I didn't quite get all of the biology. So it's really important for me today that you understand the essentials of transcriptional regulation. There are tons of nuances about transcriptional regulation, but the important core facts are going to be presented to you today. And furthermore, those facts are represented in what the NIH is capturing uh, in their ENCODE project. So as you recall, gene regulation uh, is at the center of controlling the transcribed and ultimately translated genome to produce proteins that affect various cellular function. And regulators bind proximal to these genes, where we'll see throughout the course what proximal means. Uh, and regulate the activity of genes, either positively or negatively. And as was discussed on Tuesday, these regulators cooperate with other proteins, including mediator and RNA polymerase, to form complexes that transcribe genes into RNA that is then processed and ultimately translated into protein. Today, we're going to be focusing on the regulatory proteins that are the molecular switches that control gene expression. And one way to visualize this is in using X-ray crystallography, which has been done for a number of factors. We can actually see the proteins interacting uh, with the genomic bases. So a typical transcription factor is interacting, say, over a space of, say, five to 10 bases of DNA, five to 10 letters. And our challenge is to locate where these regulators bind in the genome. Now, you know that um, the genome is a big place, right? That, as Professor Kellis told you, each of our cells has about two meters of DNA at three times 10 to nine bases. If you took all of the DNA in all of your cells and put it end to end, how far would it reach? Does anybody have any idea? It's about twice the diameter of the solar system. So there's a lot of DNA in your body, just to let you know that what we're trying to understand is the function of that DNA and how it works together uh, to Produce examples of transcription factors in our DNA. And as was discussed last time, you saw the idea there. There's sequence motifs or particular letters or base pairs that the transcription factors recognize for sequence specific binding. Now, I will also tell you something an important fact that uh, is not always mentioned, which is that although these factors bind to regulate genes, they are not always sufficient to regulate genes. And that has a consequence, which is that there's a fair amount of what's called neutral binding in the genome. There's factors that simply bind to the genome, but really don't have any functions, like putting your car in neutral. And so be aware that when you're thinking about the binding of factors to the genome, it's extraordinarily important functionally, but does not always directly lead to a result. So the complexity of the code uh, is sort of corresponds to the complexity of the organism. Bacteria have their regulatory sequences directly proximal to the promoter sequence, which is where RNA polymerase II binds and then transcribes the gene. As we go up the hierarchy of species complexity, for example, if we go up the yeast, you can see that the regulatory elements are now spaced further away from the promoter, which allows for more complex regulatory architecture. 
as we get to a species like humans, uh, it could be a million bases away from the gene itself uh, for a particular enhancer to regulate the gene. In fact, about one third of the enhancers, roughly speaking, skip the gene that's closest to them and jump over to regulate, regulate another gene. So immediate physical proximity is not necessarily a guarantee of regulatory activity. So if we want to understand the regulatory code, we can think about it in multiple levels. At the bottom level, we have these regulatory networks or circuits that describe a logic gate kind of formalism for how the genes are regulated. Both the inputs and the outputs are these logic gates that ultimately control what are known as effector genes that synthesize proteins that actually are the worker bees of the cell. The next level up is the organization of a given gene into both coding and non-coding regulatory regions. And just to be clear, when you, what is the definition of a gene sequence in the genome? The definition I prefer is that a gene consists of all of the DNA bases necessary to produce its protein product and all of its regulatory sequences. So a gene comprises all of them. So we need to be specific when we're talking about only the sequences that produce the protein, sometimes called as the open reading frames of a particular gene. At the top of this slide, you'll see a particular constellation of enhancers, which are individual little DMA sentences, so to speak. These sentences are comprised of motifs like words. They're arranged in a constellation that allows them to regulate a gene in response to a particular cellular condition. And part of the, our job now, now that the human genome is sequenced, is actually learning both the words and the grammar of the human genome to understand how it's regulated in a precise fashion. So the reason we care about this is that if you think about cellular dysfunction, we need to understand what's going wrong in the cell, what's being dysregulated, diseases like cancer, where basically they get into an infinite loop and they start dividing in an uncontrolled fashion. Also, cells respond to external stimuli in particular ways. They have receptors that actually receive these stimuli and translate them and signal them into the nucleus by modifying transcription factors. And furthermore, if we want to create replacement cells, so let's say that your pancreas conks out on you and you want a new pancreas, okay? How do you make a new pancreas? De novo, right? Well, if you take one of your skin cells, we know that you can reprogram it to be an embryonic stem cell. And then how can you take that embryonic stem cell, grow it in culture, and direct its fate to be a pancreatic cell? So you can actually produce a brand new pancreas. Science fiction? Actually not. Clinical trials are starting this year for doing exactly that for patients. That is, taking embryonic stem cells that are been produced from humans and directing them to pancreatic fates. So this kind of regenerative medicine where you actually want to reprogram cells is really a very important field and we need to understand what the logic is underneath the direction of cellular fate to be able to actually do these kinds of engineering feats of magic. Now, Regulators come in many different varieties, and I'll just point out that some of them always bind to the same genes. For example, in this particular diagram, LU3 is a yeast transcription factor that regulates the generation of amino acids, biosynthesis. Uh, MSN2 is an example of the gene you don't really want active in your cells. It's a stress response protein. And the way it works in yeast is that it's normally in the cytoplasm, but when the yeast get stress, like heat stress, that protein gets transported into the nucleus and binds to genes that turn on to affect cellular function to respond to that stress. Other genes like GCN4 actually have, they bind more genes, uh, in this case, when more amino acids are needed. And finally, a gene like STEROL12 is a transcription factor that binds to different genes depending upon uh, the mating type of the yeast and what's going on its reproductive cycle. So this can be sort of distilled down into 
uh, draft regulatory code of a species. Here I show you yeast, and you see all the genes in this particular region of the genome and the little regulatory sequences in between the genes. These so called quote unquote intergenic regions for between genes uh, describe the potential regulators for those genes, as we just discussed. Well, now that the human genome is sequenced, the next logical thing to do is to produce the same kind of regulatory code for the human genome, which is in a much bigger place than the yeast genome. So the ENCODE project was started by the National Institutes of Health, cost hundreds of millions of dollars, involved many different research groups, including Professor Callis's group and, and my research group. And it's mostly based upon technologies from last Tuesday's lecture and today's lecture. And just to give you a bird's eye view of the ENCODE project, there are many different data types that we'll be talking about throughout the term and how to process them using both conventional and deep learning technologies. Suffice today, we're going to be talking about chip seek technology for locating where regulators bind to the genome. Uh, and last time, Professor Kellis talked about uh, DNA seek and attack seek for identifying what parts of the genome are open. And remember, the genome has to be accessible for the cellular machinery, the cellular interpreter to be able to get access to those bases so it can see it, so it can then interpret it. If the, if the genome is all closed up, it can't see the bases, so it can't work on it. So the first level of gene regulation is accessibility, opening it up. And the second level is recognizing specific sequences to implement regulatory function. Okay, so how can we discover the genomic, genomic regulatory code? Well, we talked a little bit about this last time. And one thing I want you to do throughout these lectures, and also throughout your whole scientific career, is to take a critical attitude. When somebody tells you something, it's okay to think about it for a moment and to ask questions like, well, how replicable is this? How interpretable is the result? What could have gone wrong in producing these data? And at what spatial resolution are the data being produced? Is it single base pair? Is it 500 base pairs? And when people show you slides with examples of genomic regions and particular data on those regions, they're showing you their typical best example. So always remember when you're thinking about the analysis of data, especially high throughput data, to think critically. And so if I show you something today or any other day during a lecture, and you have a question about where it came from or what could go wrong, I want you to challenge me on that. It's very, it's one of the most important things you can get out of a class like this is thinking that way, thinking critically, and not just accepting what everybody tells you is true. Okay. So to that end, um, we're going to start talking about ChIP-seq. And I have my portable genome with me. Where is it? Here it is. Yeah. Everybody traveled with a portable genome, right? Everybody has one of these? Yeah. So we have some, we have a, Genomic DNA here, where I sit by this nice red ribbon. We have a couple of protein proteins that are actually binding to the genome like this, right? And I'm getting stage direction from my TV director. I'm making my big appearance today. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here we go. So here's the, here's our portable genome. Oops, this genome is having a dysfunction. It's not currently not possible right enough or something. Okay. <laughs> Oh, it's turn over, turn over, right. So here's the idea, right? If you want to identify where these orange regulators are binding in the genome, which is a very big place, what we're going to do is we're going to produce an antibody that binds specifically to this regulator. And so we're going to do what's called immunoprecipitation to pull this out of solution after we cut up the genome in a little bit. So we're, we cut the genome into bits. Imagine I cut this ribbon here. And I only purify the bits of the ribbon that contain this factor, okay? So there are many examples of this down in the genome. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sequence the bits of the genome here at the end, these tails of the genome that are sticking out. Typically, I'm going to do some kind of mechanical shearing to actually break the DNA using sonication. 
more recent technologies called chip exo, use an exonuclease treatment to chew back the DNA. So I only have a little bit that's, oops, like this that's stuck inside uh, the transcription factor. And recall that what's going on is that we have two strands of DNA, right? The double helix, and we have the back of the city line, right? And so I'm going to get reads from this strand of DNA and from this strand of DNA in opposite directions. Right. So I'm going to have reads here and reads here. For simplicity, I'm mostly going to talk about reads, say, in one direction only. But reciprocally, you can imagine all the same methodologies and functions apply to the other strand. And when I do the analysis, I use data from both strands for my thinking. So when I produce these short reads, right, so what happens is I don't sequence the whole genome. I sequence little bits of it, right? And it's important to understand the process that called short read mapping, where I take these little bits, say bits of maybe 30 base pairs or letters, and I ask, from whence did this arise in the genome? Where or oh, where did you come from? And I have a reference genome from the species, and I have a computational algorithm. Uh, if you're fascinated by this, um, there are many great papers about how to actually do short read mapping, and now hardware is becoming uh, more popular to assist in this. But the idea, as you can see from this diagram, is to take the reads that you have and map them to where they match in the genome. But there are two nuances that I really want you to understand, right? The two nuances are that um, Reads may match multiple places in the genome. Why is that? Well, because any particular 30 base pair stretch or sequence, if, for example, if it came from a repetitive element, may match hundreds of times across the genome. And so these so-called multi-map reads, you can, when you're doing the matching, you can exclude them or you can include them. Typically, they're included. And these multi-map reads are something you need to be aware of. The second thing is, surprisingly, sequencing is not perfect, which means that with every sequence base, you get an error statistic. And so you'd prefer to align on high quality bases. So you pick alignments where the high quality bases are aligning to the reference genome. So that's the essence of short read mapping. You have these little sequences, say 30 base pairs long. You want to know where they came from in the genome to do this mapping. And you then can produce a file that records for each read where it is in terms of its genome location. How are we doing? Everybody understand that? Yes? Good? Are you doing back there, last row? That all clear? Good. All right. Perfect. So now here is some actual chip seek read data. The x-axis is genomic location, where the black bars are every thousand bases. You can see the, the positive and negative strands, as I've shown here on the board. The reads mapping the positive and negative strands of the, of the genome. And the question is, how would you identify where, in this case, OCT4 is binding? Because we've used an antibody. So this is OCT4, right? We use an antibody to OCT4 to pull it down. We sequence all the little fragments that are bound to it, and we map it to the genome, and this is what we get. How many people think that we could actually reliably extract OCT4 binding from this data? Any, remember from the critical thinking? Um, what could be going wrong here? Yes. Pardon? The antibody could be non specific. Very good. So there is a whole process in the ENCODE project for qual qualifying antibodies for being specific. That's good. Well, how about if I showed you a control track? I always recommend controls. Good for your health. Um, 
The way we would do a control is we do exactly the same reaction, except that we would not use the antibody for OCT4. Okay, what we would do is we would just do what's called a, a, a negative control or sequence what's called the whole cell extract. You'll hear that term used. We're simply going to sequence something without doing the immunopurification. And now when we do that, we get this, where the bottom track is without immunopurification. So what is going on? Oh my goodness. What's going on is that those little green bars at the very bottom are repetitive elements in the genome. And so what's happening is that we have reads that are coming from some repetitive element somewhere that are mapping back here, but they don't necessarily mean that OCT4 is binding here because those bottom reads from that bottom track weren't exposed to the OCT4 antibody at all. All right? So we need to figure out how to deal with situations like this. And that's why doing negative controls is extraordinarily important. Okay. So, but this, you're probably gonna be happier with, right? This is legitimate OCT4 binding around the SOX2 gene. OCT4 and SOX2 are key regulators of embryonic cell, cell state. Um, and what we would like to do is to take these data and discover where OCT4 is binding exactly. Remember the black bars are about a thousand base pairs we like to be able to localize the binding of that protein in the genome to a much higher resolution, say within plus or minus five base pairs if we possibly could. So one thing you note is that when we shear something, when we take um, DNA and we shear it, and if we look at the monthly distribution of leads, you would expect the further out we go, the less likely we are going to see your read, right? Whereas the closer the protein is, the more likely we're going to see a read. Because if you look at each base having the probability of undergoing the shear reaction, it's going to fall off um, exponentially as I go further and further out. So you might imagine that that I have a shear distribution looks like this, that the redistribution coming from an event located right here is going to look like this from this protein, right? And in fact, I can characterize that shear distribution. Uh, and it turns out to be slightly different for different proteins, which is what we would hope for, right? Because different proteins have different uh, parts of the genome they include, and thus uh, we would expect there to be a slightly different shear distribution. It turns out that we can learn that shear distribution directly from the data that we saw. That is what we can do is we can start with sort of the vanilla everyday shear distribution, and then we can use that to discover binding events, and then we can tune up our shear distribution using those binding events and then do a better job. Okay? Question. So is there an equation for like the directionality of why it's shifted to the left of zero but the better? Um, why is it shifted to the left? Well, remember that when we're doing reads in this direction, it's going to be like this, right? Um, and the reason it shifted that way is that I am always sequencing from the five prime end in, from the from this side in. So I, I need to have an end to do my sequencing. Okay? And that's why. I'm not going to see things down here because I need to have an end. Okay, good question. Uh, yeah, sir. How can you see from the from that virus to be So when you need to utilize the DNA, you get uh, sequencing. Yeah. So did I get the protocols to do that? Yeah. Does it work by the chain of different protocols? The answer is the question is does the redistribution that we're seeing here change depending on the protocol you're using to take the sequence? Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, changes can change quite radically. Um, it can change depending upon how hard you shear the DNA. 
whether or not you do enzymatic digestion, which is basically chop things up here and here. Um, but once you have the DNA molecules themselves, um, the exact sequencing instrument doesn't really matter that much, except, for example, how long the reads are. Okay, so we have our basket of reads. What we can do is this. We can say, okay, we have a bunch of possible event locations in the genome. Say there are M locations in our genome. Our M could be very large. And we have our observed reads. And what we want to do is assign responsibility for each location to a read. So let's just say that pi represents, for each location, its responsibility in terms of fraction for all the reads. So for example, if the pi of a particular location, like location 100, was 1 one hundredth, it meant that it was responsible for 1 one hundredth of all the reads we were considering. So the idea is we're going to build a mixture model where the pi vector is describing for each location of the genome whether or not it's producing reads or not. And the idea would be that for this particular location, the genome, we're going to be producing reads this way and this way, so we should have a very large pi value here. And we would like pi to be zero or close to zero further away from here. Right? So we're going to assign probability mass to pi to wherever we believe that there is an event being caused. And in order to do that, we're going to model our read population using the shear function on the right-hand side. So we say that we can ascribe a responsibility for this location for a particular read observed here based upon how likely it is to come from this location based upon the shear distribution. And we can do the same thing for another location. We can say, oh, well, gee, if a read came from, say, a read came from um, here, you know, is it more likely that it came from this location or it came from this location, location number one or location number two? Well, clearly, it's going to be more likely it came from location number two than from location number one because the probability of a read coming from this location is higher than this location in the genome. So what we want to do is we want to simultaneously solve for where the events are happening while also trying to reduce the complexity of regularized pi so it's as sparse as possible, right? If that makes sense. Any questions about this at all? Details, you know? Okay, so let's just say that we solve this mixture model. And I'm going to show you what happens when we actually run uh, an expectation maximization algorithm to uh, solve for pi. Uh, what you're going to look at is the x-axis is genome location uh, corresponding to the reads that you see in the top track. And the y-axis is the value of pi. And we're going to see what happens, OK? Oh, great. Okay, here we go. So you can see it working away here. And what you can observe is that we have a lot of probability mass around each location. There are little bumps all the way between the two binding events. So this really isn't too satisfactory in the sense that we did solve for, a, for the best solution of pi given our constraints, but it isn't really ideal. So what we can do then is we can change our strategy a little bit and we can put a prior on pi. We can say, I want to penalize pi uh, by a parameter called alpha s, which means I want to, I can turn, I can crank that up and make pi more and more unlikely in a particular case. You can make it sparser and sparser. So I can push that as far as I want. I have another parameter called alpha m which I can increase when I think there's a motif there that might indicate binding. So I can bias by binding in two ways. I can say I want to make it sparser by increasing the value of alpha s. I can actually try and get it locked onto the right location by wherever I think there's a motif. I can put a little bit of extra 
zap into alpha M to try and get my EM algorithm to converge there. Okay, and when I do this, um, uh, what you'll see is that the, just give you some details that are, will be already posted, but remember alpha men is the fraction of all the reads produced by location M and that they all sum to one, and that this um, fractional responsibility of a location M for read N um, is something I'm going to be computing. And so I will produce an EM algorithm that allows me to um, update uh, my estimate of pi by first computing the responsibility of a location for a particular read. And you note that that's using the formulation we had before, where we actually use the likelihood of reads coming from a location, pi sub m, plus assuming it's coming from that location, what's the probability of the read given that location? And that in the first step for all locations and all reads, I compute that responsibility factor. And then in my next step, the maximization step, for a given location, I say, okay, how many reads did you sign up for? How responsible are you for how many reads? And that's N sub M. So we're gonna count up how many reads that location of the genome is responsible for. And after we've done it for all the locations in the genome, we can then update pi simply by looking at the fractional responsibility of that location for reads versus all the other locations in the genome. And note that the way that, that prior falls out is that it actually is in the units of reads that if I turn up alpha sub s, it means I need a, a certain number of reads in a location to actually be significant. And alpha sub m, which is the motif positive prior, adds some extra reads at a particular location. And the max there, make sure it doesn't go negative. And the neat thing about this is that it does component elimination. As soon as a particular component of pi goes to zero, it's never to be seen again. Zip, it's dead, okay? So if I use this methodology, I can then run my algorithm. And what you can see is it's much sparser that my pi vector shown on the bottom here, that's the genomic location and the y-axis is its value, actually gives me a much more sparse and accurate representation of where the events are in the genome. Now you're probably saying to yourself, okay, yeah, right. You're gonna go over all the locations in the genome, all three billion of them, for all reads, all 100 million of them, this sounds intractable. But what you do is you break the genome up into pieces and you can solve each piece independently, okay? So you're not considering everything, all bases and all reads at once, because you obviously have mapped the reads to the genome. So you know for a particular spatial part of the genome, what reads belong to it, and you have a very constrained space and you can solve that constrained environment. Okay, any questions about the details of that? All right, so what would even be better is if what we did was we alternated between event finding and motif discovery. So the idea would be that you use this algorithm to find out where the events are in the genome. And then at each one of those event locations said, hey, is there a DNA sequence there that looks similar to all the other places? Can I build a model of that motif at all the other occurrences? And if so, can I then use that to score each location to give a little prior boost to that location as to where the binding event is actually occurring. If I want the binding event to occur right smack dab in the middle of the motif. So one way to think about this is that if you want to think that this is the location, there's going to be a motif here, and I want to identify that sequence motif, the letters here that correspond to the binding of the factor. And if I discover that the factor is binding right here, I discover that motif. So remember, there are thousands of other locations in the genome with that factor is binding to. So I can do a simultaneous discovery of motifs and binding event locations, which gives me very high spatial resolution. Now recall, we talked about what motifs are uh, and how they're represented. Just to review that, 
what we want to do is we want to compute the amount of information contained in each face of the genome. Now, if the all four bases are equal probable at a position in the genome, right, then it's highly uncertain. And that means that there are two bits of entropy or uncertainty at that location. So in order to compute the amount of information at a location of the genome, we subtract the entropy away from the maximum amount of entropy, which is the amount of information, which is two bits. So if there's complete entropy, as I have A, C, G, and T are all equally probable, I have two bits of entropy, I subtract that from two, I have zero information content there. If, for example, I only have A at a particular position of the genome, I have zero entropy, so I have two bits of information. So the idea is that I use an equation to compute the amount of information at each location of the genome. And I use that to scale the relative frequency of the bases uh, in what's called a motif logo, is what you can see here. So the height of the logo is the number of bits of information that are contained in that location of the genome. And the letters and the relative size of the letters contains their relative frequency. So it gives you two pieces of information at once. It gives you how much information there is, and it gives you the relative frequency of the different bases. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, so suffice to say that if you look at the spatial accuracy of different methods of predicting where proteins bind in the genome, what we have just discussed, the so-called GEM method, actually does a very good job, uh, where if you look at spatial resolution here, you can see that over half of the events are, are bang on for the GABP factor, and for CTCF, just basically over 90% of the factors are right to the base of where they are, judging uh, from where they're known to map to. And that's in part because it's using sequence information as well as the read information to help it determine where factors are binding. You can see that the CTCF motif must be a stronger indicator of binding than the GBP motif. And we can use this kind of information in a variety of ways, but um, I'll give you my own little personal pet peeve, right? Is that people call this process peak binding, right? Because you're looking for peaks of sequence reads that have piled up on the genome. Well, the reason that I personally don't call it that is there is a peak and underlying that peak are two binding events, right? Because if you have closely spaced binding events, you're gonna get one pile of reads on top of them that basically is the addition of two of those shear functions. And the method we just talked about deconvolves those into independent events. And that allows us to look for what's called homotypic binding, which means two factors that are binding together, right? So that's an important thing to know that certain methods don't resolve one peak into independent binding events. Uh, but when we look at this, we can find out that, in fact, uh, the method we just discussed also it has the best results in terms of being able to recover known motifs from a large number of uh, chip seek experiments here, hundreds of experiments, 214 to be exact, or for 71 transcription factors. And we can use the same kind of spatial information in other ways, which we'll talk about in a moment. But first, I'd like to talk about which events are significant. How do you know when something has been predicted whether or not it's real? So let's return to our unfortunate example of the control track that has a large number of reads. Now you can just look at that and you can say, hey look, the reads on the top track don't correspond to real OC4 binding events on the genome. And a way to formalize that would be to say, let's take all the reads in this picture, okay? Uh, let's flip a coin as to whether they go fall the top track or the bottom track, okay? And we're gonna say, if we look at the reads in the bottom track, 
what is the likelihood that that number of reeds or fewer landed there? And if that's a very small probability based upon coin flips, we'll say it's a, that the event is significant in the top track. That is, that if the overwhelmingly large number of reeds wound up in the top track and weren't in the bottom, that they weren't in the control, then we'll call it a significant event. And we can actually compute a p-value that way by using a binomial uh, to correspond to our coin flip. So we can do our coin flip and we can compute if the probability, assuming random coin flips of reads between the IP track and the whole select track track, that we actually saw a particular number of reads in the control track or fewer. So it goes from zero to the number of reads we saw on the control track. If that's a probability of that event is small, we say that it's unlikely this happened by chance. That makes sense to you? Okay. Perfect. Okay, so that's one way of understanding what's significant. Another way which is gaining popularity is something called the irreproducible data rate. Now that's a mouthful if you ever heard one before, otherwise known as IDR. And the concept is actually elegant, right? You take the events from two different replicates, biological replicates, and you rank them from the most significant event to the least significant, replicate number one, most significant to least significant, and replicate number two. Now, you compare the two lists, and you ask, how do the ranks correspond of identical events in the two different lists? That is, is the most significant event in list A the same as the most significant event in, in list B, right? And you go down the list comparing the events and see how the rank correspondence works out. And the overall hypothesis is when the ranks are consistent across replicates, you have reproducible events across the two replicates. But when the ranks start breaking down across replicates, it becomes irreproducible. And here you can see actual data from some ChIP-seq Chip experiments and its replicate. You can see the, the IDR values here. And when the, the lower left corner is the most significant part, right? Because they have the, the lowest ranks, right? They're the most significant, or I should say the highest rank, rank one. And as the ranks increase, you can see the computed IDR value starts getting larger and larger. The IDR value is the probability that an event belongs to the irreproducible component of the rank distribution. So another way to look at this is that if you compute this function psi, which is the percent of pairs of rank in the upper t percent of, of, of rank list one and rank list two, or a replica one and replica two, you see in this plot on the left, say when psi is 0.4, it means that 0.4 of the pairs are rank um, in the upper 0.4 of the ranks. So it shows you that there's a good correspondence between the rank threshold and where people appear in the ranks in the two lists. But as you keep going, uh, there can be a discontinuity. You get to a particular point here called the decay point where the ranks don't correspond. So if you take the derivative of the psi function, which is the rank correspondence function, you see that when the, you get to the decay point, you can see that the slope um, goes a little screwy, right? It goes, it goes actually to zero for a little bit and then increases. So what the IDR method does is it fits a mixture model to these two different rank distributions. There is a component, which is the reproducible component of the ranks that are in correspondence with one another between the two replicates, and the irreproducible component of ranks, which are not in correspondence with one another. And for a given event, you can compute the probability it's a member of the irreproducible component of ranks. Okay? And that is the way that you can judge whether or not a particular event is significant and consistent across replicates. 
Now, the beauty of the, oh, there's a question in the back. Yes. Um, it means that the, the question is, why am I calling the mixture components? All of the reads um, are considered to have come from one of two components. Um, one component is a is the well-behaved part of the ranks, and the other component is the non-well-behaved component of the ranks. And we don't know a priori from where a particular event arose. And so we need to model this probabilistically. And so we assign a, a probability for each event from whether it occurred, came from the well-ordered well distribution or the unordered distribution based upon some statistics about its behavior. Uh, and so the, I, I can post the full paper for this, which is actually quite interesting, but the neat idea is that because it's a mixture model, we're not assigning an event to either being reproducible or non-reproducible. We're giving a probability of which component it's in. And that's why it's a mixture of those two things. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, okay. Now, this is an important technique for you to remember into the future. Why? Imagine you have expression data from, say, two um, RNA expression experiments, and you want to figure out which genes are significant. Well, you can do the same thing, right? You can actually take the expression data and rank the genes from most highly expressed to least expressed, and then the other experiment, most highly expressed to least expressed, and because it's a ranking, it's non-parametric, you don't have to do any normalization. And then you simply let the IDR method tell you which components of the rank lists are consistent across the replicates. So it allows you to actually determine which gene sets are significant in terms of their expression without having to do further statistics on it. And if you look at the way this applies, say, in more detail to ChIP-seq data, you can see on the far right-hand side, you can set the IDR rate. Uh, obviously, you want things to have the IDR rate of zero because they're the most significant. They have a zero probability of belonging to the irreproducible component. But as you relax that, you get more and more significant, this person's not on my favorite list for calling them peaks, but nonetheless, um, events, okay? And you can see the middle one is the plot we saw before where we have rank and rank on the X and Y axis respectively, and the red dots are the bad boys, right? They actually aren't really replicable. And the far left is the same exact data shown in terms of signal strength. And you can see the red dots, which have low signal strength on the X and Y axes, are not reproducible at an IDA rate of 1%, whereas the black ones are reproducible and have higher signal strength. Okay? Any questions about IDR? Okay. Put on your critical thinking hats now. When wouldn't you use IDR for actually figuring out significant events or genes or whatever between two replicates? Yes. There's no way to rank events or any kind of. No way to rank? Yeah, I, I like what you're saying. Um, here's here's, the, here's the, uh, the observation I'll make, which is that. This assumes that there's a consistent rank ordering of whatever you're looking at across replicates, right? So for gene expression, that's pretty well understood, right? I mean, genes are expressed at different levels. And so basically you're asking, are the genes expressed at coordinate ranks across two different, say, cell types or what have you, right? But is it really the case that the number of reads associated with a gene sequence really is, uh, a ranking? Isn't it the case that all complexes are going to be more or less the same size? Why would you expect the reads to actually vary that much between different ship seat complexes? Is ranking really a good thing to do here? Just putting that out there. Um, the other thing is, imagine that somebody came to you and said, oh, IDR, it's really great. I'm using it on my chip seat data. I put the recount of an event on x-axis, right, and the recount of the replicate on the y-axis, and I do my IDR, everything looks great. I'm just using my recounts to rank 
right, the event, how many recounts are assigned to each one. Would there be any problem with that? As opposed to p-values. Why would we want to compute p-values? Yes. You might have a situation where there are lots of weeks at a given locus in your uh, experimental track, but there are also a lot of weeks in the weeks all the time. Exactly. Actually, no. actually, that's exactly right. So basically, unless you're actually correcting for the whole cell extract, you actually don't know which events are real and which ones are not. So typically what you do is you compute p-values for chip seek events, and then you rank them from smallest p-value to largest, and then you do IDR of the two replicates. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> now I'm going to ask you a different question. <clears throat> Imagine that um, I have a set of sequences. Actually, I'll ask you a, a separate question first. If I have um, a deck of cards, okay, and I draw five cards from it. How many different combinations of five cards could I draw from a deck of 52? Roughly speaking, can somebody give me the equation for that? Yeah. About two million, right? Two and a half million, but I mean, I'll give you the extra half, okay? But, but yeah, it's, you know, it's a 52 to five, it's equal to 52 factorial over 47 factorial divided by five factorial. The five factorial is there because we don't care which order they're in, right? All right, so that's how many combinations of five cards come out of 52, right? Just want to make sure we have this choose technology down so everybody dredges that back up from their memory banks from two semesters ago or whatever, right? All right, so if I have a set of sequences, all right, and I have, um, let's say we have, let's say we have n sequences, all right, n sequences. And I have a set of bound, some set of sequences are bound by a factor. Okay, and another set of sequences the chain of rotation. Okay, the question is if I have an overlap of x sequences that between the set that contains the motif, the sequence that contains the motif, and the set that are bound, how significant is that overlap? Well, what's the probability I can see? Exactly x sequences at random. Now, this may be hard for you to conceptualize thinking about this as a completely null experiment, right? But there are this many ways for me to choose x sequences from D, and then for the remainder, I have n minus D, and I need to choose s minus x sequences, and then the probability is how many combinations of this form do I have versus just choosing the sequences in general from n. So the probability of this overlap happening at random is this number for exactly that number of overlap at random, right? At random. And if you don't fully grok this, I advise you to think about it a little bit in terms of um, the fact this is the number of combinations that result in this, and this is the total number of ways I can arrange S within N. Okay? And thus, if I want to compute the significance of motifs appearing in bound sequences, I could compute a p-value simply by summing up um, for this number of occurrences, X number of occurrences or larger appearing in the bound set. Okay? This is one way to compute significance of motif occupancy in sequences that I see. So I make sure that everybody has seen that before. Okay. Any questions about that? How many people have seen that before? Hypergeometric distribution? Oh, that's interesting. Some people. Okay. Now, just to show you that what we're talking about today is quite relevant, this is the actual chip seek processing pipeline from the ENCODE project, okay? And although we have given you the speed reading version of this, suffice to say, the very top line of this is the mapping of the reads to the genome that we talked about, the short read mapping. And then we do the unfortunately named peak calling, uh, which the second method is the method we talked about in class today, GEM. And then we use IDR across replicates to figure out which are the significant events, and we do motif discovery. So this is the way 
that the ENCODE project has formalized the pipeline for processing ChIP-seq data. Okay, let's talk about transcription factors and their drinking buddies. But you didn't know that transcription factors have drinking buddies. Yeah, they hang out at the bar together. Uh, and so the idea is that there are these large enhancer complexes, um, like the interferon beta enhancer zone, where there are many factors that interact. And you can see on the right hand side all the different sequences that are bound by different proteins, and they interact with one another. And any kind of mutation uh, in those sequences will cause the whole thing to fall apart. But they interact with one another, as Professor Kellis mentioned on Tuesday, to implement more complex regulatory architectures. So in order to discover these regulatory architectures de novo, what we want to do is look at spacing constraints between factors as discovered by ChIP-seq. So if we do a lot of ChIP-seq experiments, we localize where factors are binding, then we can actually look at which factors have constraints. So we talked about the OC4 and SOX2 factors earlier on in lecture today. It turns out they're drinking buddies. And what you're seeing here is every single row of this picture is a different part of the genome where the bases are colored as shown above. And the OC4 or SOX2 binding is occurring in the middle of this diagram. And you can clearly see the motifs for the two factors represented in the enrichment of colors there where the factors are binding to the genome, right? So we can then use our methodology to resolve the exact spacing of factors. And we can call things significant when they occur more frequently than in control regions. So if we consider around a particular binding event, we can look, say, within 400 base pairs, minus 200, plus 200 around a binding event, and ask what other factors are binding there, and whether that occurs more often than not, right? And we can do that by looking at, say, 200 different factors, and assume that the, they're really only interacting if they're closer than plus or minus 200, using a um, Poisson uh, to compute the significance of that event occurring. And so when we do that, what we find uh, is that there are lots of constrained pairs of interacting factors as revealed by these data we have. And if we look at the spacing between them, this matrix shows you for all these different factors that have been profiled, in this case, in K562 cells, which is a cancer cell line, you can see the numbers here represent the number of bases between the factors. So a large number of factors are precisely spaced uh, in this, in their genomic context. And some examples like the June Foss factors, the McMax factors you can see here are factors that have these precise spacing when they're binding to the genome. And furthermore, some factors have large number of different spacing. So this is, this is the number of different um, spatial binding constraints that are discovered between different pairs of factors. And if you ask what's going on, you say, well, some of them are competitive binders. You see the one or the other, uh, like C June or USF1, you can see they both bind roughly to the same sequences. Or it could be, um, sorry, that was, that was cooperative binding. This is competitive binding between CTCF and EGR1. You can see they're actually binding to exactly the same sequences uh, in the genome. And then there's also collaborative binding. And this is sort of an interesting one. You can see um, the, um, the motif of HNF4 alpha, and which is the middle motif, and FOXA1 is the left-hand motif. You can see how FOXA1 has different spacing constraints, or not really constraints, but different distances from the middle one, but it's, it's present in almost all of them there, right? Great, so, and I just also wanted to point out that binding is not always evolutionarily conserved. Um, you know, we often study mouse as a model for human, uh, and what we want to know is whether or not um, mouse binding really is completely indicative of where things are going to bind in human. 
And if we look at some sample factors um, in liver, these are four key liver transcription factors. And if we profile them uh, at their promoter proximal binding locations, what we find is that a very small number of them are actually um, completely conserved, right? In other words, only 3% of all the events of these factors are conserved across species, and a large number of the events are not conserved. So that tells you that we need to be a little careful about making generalizations about regulation going from one species to another species. Okay, let's turn now to deep learning and how we can use deep learning techniques to actually evaluate the binding of factors in the genome. So traditionally, you know, we have looked at a collection of sequences that are all bound by a factor. We've lined them up, we compute counts, and we get frequencies and compute those weight matrices that you have seen. As we discussed last time, there is another approach, right, which is to actually build these layered network architectures to detect binding events where we would start with a convolutional filter that represented the sequence specificity of a particular transcription factor. And this would learn motifs. And we could have more than one convolutional filter to learn more than one motif. And then the next layer of the network might look at the combination motifs. Now we've seen that already, right? I just showed you a whole bunch of examples of factors that are collaboratively or competitively binding. And then we could also look at regulatory grammars. Right? It has the idea of how do you form well-formed genomic sentences out of these motifs that correspond to particular regulatory phrases to implement regulatory function. And then the output of our network could just be bound or unbound. And can I take a example sequence and tell you whether or not a factor is going to bind to it or not? after I trained it appropriately on data. So an early methodology for this was something called deep bind. And deep bind was a very shallow convolutional neural network. I will tell you that it was very shallow compared to even moderately sized networks like the Google net for uh, image understanding. And let's evaluate how well this network does, and how we can make it better to on two different tasks. So one task is um, to figure out what architecture worked the best for modeling DNA protein binding and how deep should the network be? How many layers should we have? And what components of the network contribute the most to its performance? And is it specific to a particular transcription factor? Or are we going to learn general architectural principles for designing ways to approach understanding the genome with, with deep learning? And today we're going to look at um, a collection of different architectures, and we're going to look at them on two different tasks and see whether or not the optimum architecture is task specific. Now, the two different tasks are this. One task is you take a collection of DNA sequences that are bound by a particular transcription factor and you have the positive set, which are the set of sequences that contain the motif that you know. And in the second set, you take the same exact sequences, only you scramble by exchanging the bases in the motif to randomize them. And you ask whether or not you can rediscover the motif. So that's called motif discovery. And the idea is you want to learn uh, a motif against a background of similar nucleotide frequency. And so that's a pretty simple task. I actually sort of think that that is almost too simple. Another task is motif occupancy, which is I give you two sets of sequences, all of which contain motif for the factor you're concerned with. And the positive set is bound by the factor, and the negative set is not bound by the factor. And we ask the methodology to determine sequence features that can discriminate between the bound and the unbound set. What could those features be? 
Anybody have any idea? Remember, both sets have the motif in them. But one is bound by the factor and one is not bound by the factor. What do you think? Ideas? Yes. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Maybe there are motifs for cofactors, right? We saw before the, the drinking buddies that the factors have. Yeah. Maybe they're not happy if they're drinking buddies that are around. So um, it also could be that there may be factors that actually influence chromatin architecture, like pioneer factors that open chromatin. So we could take all that sequence information and try and learn these auxiliary factors that are controlling motif occupancy. So if we take this task and we use 690 different data sets from the ENCODE project and try and do these tasks on this a diverse set of experiments, then we can actually look at how well these architectures work across a bunch of different factors. And we can turn various knobs, right? We can try and make the information more localized by making the cooling window smaller so that a particular filter is only um, looking over a smaller range of the input genome. Uh, we could add more convolution kernels, which is going to actually allow it to recognize more drinking buddies, so to speak, more other cofactors that actually are contributing to the binding of, 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 of the primary factor we care about. Or we could make it deeper, which might allow it to actually understand more regulatory architecture, more complex phrases by doing more nonlinear logic on the combination of factors. So um, we'll explore all of these things uh, in the next couple of minutes, but we're going to actually explore more kernels, deeper and smaller pooling size by looking at a collection of different architectures and ask how well they perform on all these data sets that we have queued up for it. And when we do so, we first wanted to go back and check to make sure that the baseline architecture that we're comparing it to, deep bind, we get similar performance. The answer is that we do, except it turns out the deep bind implementation that was published fails on a collection of inputs. Um, and the recapitulation of its architecture actually succeeds in everything. So there were some bugs in the original deep bind implementation. But nonetheless, pressing ahead fearlessly, if we look at the motif discovery task, and remember, the POVs set has the motifs, the negative set does not have the motifs. So all we're asking is, can you discover a motif? Well, it turns out that the baseline works quite well. If you add additional kernels, it works a little bit better, not really. Um, but additional layers actually does not help really very much when you get the network deeper on this task. Right, and so the hypothesis is, is that most of the factors determining motif presence are really simple, right? Is the motif there or not? Now, the, another task is that we can look at the motif occupancy task. Now, once again, this is the positive set has the motifs, the negative set has the motifs, but the positive set we know is bound by the factor and the negative set is not bound by the factor. So now this is more nuanced because the classifier has to determine additional sequence features that are helping determine whether or not the sequence is actually bound or not. And what we find is that we do poor on this task than the other task. That's absolutely no surprise, right? It's a harder task. Um, we find that the baseline's performance goes down quite a bit that we, when we add more kernels, we get increased performance. That is, that was what we expect, more convolutional kernels, which is gonna give us the ability to recognize more cofactors, and so we should be able to do better. And if we look at um, adding more constrained location, that doesn't really help us very much. Um, 
And if we add, however, more layers, deeper networks have slightly higher performance, which would suggest that unlike the, the other task, which is the motif discovery task, in this task, actually having more layers may allow us to unravel more combinatorial logic. Okay? So, the other thing is if we look at the observed performance and we cluster the observed performance by the observed performance, uh, what we've seen is that there are different clusters of how well different architectures. These architectures are the columns of this cluster gram. So on the left, we have more layers and smaller cooling windows. And on the right, we have simpler structures. Red means higher performance uh, with respect to um, uh, the base architecture and blue means worse. And here we have our 700 and some chip seek experiments. And it'd be nice to know why these experiments are clustering uh, in this particular fashion. And it turns out that if we look at this, as you would expect, it's the amount of training data that actually is driving the difference in these different architectures. So when you have simpler architectures, they're going to work better when you have less training data. So that's another variable you need to keep in mind when you're thinking about building your network is whether or not you have sufficient data or whether you're sufficiently powered, so to speak, to discover network architectures that can reveal um, a good classifier. And furthermore, if you look at the variance um, over all the experiments in terms of performance, as you cut back the number of training examples, the variance increases as you would expect. So as you turn down the power in terms of training examples, these classifiers do worse and worse. Okay. And I think the point is that these methods can outperform conventional methods of determining, say, the motif occupancy task, which is a tough, a tough task. So one other thing I want to talk about today, which is, you know, these factors are still valid. Okay. Anyway, so some of the factors, okay, are called pioneer factors. And they have the property that they can bind to closed chromatin. Okay, so here's our chromatin, right? It's all closed, right? Like this. Remember, Professor Kelly talked to you about how it was all closed like this? It's wrapped around nucleosomes. I don't know, we have a nucleosome here. Okay. Here we go. So here we go. And so the factor, some factors can't actually bind when they wound up on the nucleosome, right? But other factors have this really interesting property that when phosphorylated, no. <laughs> Get them open here. Where's my factor? Here we go. And the factor can come in here and it can actually get rid of the nucleosome and open up chromatin. These are called pioneer factors. Why? Because they're the pioneers. They arrive in that you know, wagon with the horses and they come in and they actually open up the chromatin and allow other factors to bind. So we can characterize um, the binding of factors to the genome by looking here if the top track is accessibility, right? We talked about last time DNA seq and attack seq is two different ways of characterizing accessibility where you get reads where the genome is accessible because you get sequencing reads from there. We can model the binding of factors to the genome using that kind of data. And when we do that modeling, um, what we could find is that <clears throat> different factors here, our collection of factors actually um, induce accessibility. That where you see the factor, you see the increased accessibility. So we can tentatively label these as computationally identified pioneer factors that are actually binding to the genome and increasing accessibility, whereas other factors don't do that, at least from our computational analysis. And once again, what we're looking at here is averaged over all, say, occurrences of of queso, which is the upper left-hand factor, if you average over all of them, plus or minus 200 base pairs, that is the accessibility profile found present in where queso is binding. You take all queso binding sites and you say you align them and you look at the accessibility pattern around them, it's accessible, okay? Any questions about that so far? Everybody who understands, yes? Oh, this is not good. Um, let's try again. 
Any questions about the details? Yes. Um, we don't know that. This is a simply a computational analysis. And so we're asking where these motifs are located, what is the accessibility around them? Later on, we're going to figure out whether or not they actually have the property of ascribing to them. Okay. Any other questions? Once again, wherever the queso motif occurs, we look at the accessibility around it and we plot it, and you see the accessibility profile here. By the way, because the accessibility profile is unequal on the left and right hand sides of the motif, you could tell that this is not a palindromic motif, right? If it was palindromic, there wouldn't be any orientation to which way the package is binding. So you have the same accessibility on the left and right. Yes? I'm confused by the bottom line. So for those who are on the floor, yes. um, I'm very so accessibility on it. Um, if it were not a pioneer, how do you expect to feel in the bind if it's not accessible? Uh, because a factor comes before or the chromatin board. In other words, there are pioneers and there are settlers. And the pioneers open the chromatin and the settlers come in afterwards and bind the genome. So the pioneers represent an initial level of regulatory control that actually makes the genome accessible. Make sense? Yes. How is the chromium in that measure? Um, that is essentially the amount of uh, relative amount of reads that we see proximal to one of these proteins. But once again, this is all computational analysis. So in order to actually figure out whether or not it works, what you can do is if you put these motifs into a closed region of the genome, that's normally closed, all wound up on the nucleosomes, and you insert these different motifs into a test construct and arrange things such that green fluorescent, fluorescent proteins only turn on when the genome is open, you can ask their relative ability to actually open the genome and to admit the expression of that fluorescent reporter. And what you see is the, the red um, factors in this plot are the computationally predicted pioneers. And they, more often than the blue non-pioneers, will open the genome and permit that fluorescent protein to be expressed. Now, the other thing I'll say is that it appears that pioneers in terms appear to be conserved uh, between human and mouse, that their chromatin opening indexes in terms of the amount of open chromatin around them appears to be quite similar. But I want to return to this for a moment in our last few minutes together. If you look at this for a moment, what is striking about it is that some of these factors like NRF1, the second from the left on the top are very asymmetric. That would seem to imply it's opening chromatin on its left side, but not on its right side. Sort of like functioning as a genomic parenthesis, right? Opening part of the genome, but not the other part. So in order to test that, one can actually put these motifs back into the reporter construct in the forward and reverse orientation and see whether or not the orientation matters in terms of the expression of fluorescent protein. And what you find is that in fact, that when you put it in the orientation where the predicted accessibility is downstream and would open up the GFP and its control constructs to the set of the machinery, in fact, you do get GFP expression and you don't when it's in the other orientation. So it appears that what's going on is that you get a direction specific accessibility control of the genome. And as I mentioned earlier, 
there are a bunch of pioneers that have these chromatin opening indices that are higher, and then there are these settler factors that come in afterwards and bind where the genome has been made ready for them. And on that note, we will end today. Thank you very much, and until next time, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.